is to provide a general account of the Chinese writing system from the first indication of its appearance about 1200 BC to roughly the beginning of the Common Era. This is the period whose study has witnessed a number of interesting and exciting developments in recent years. As we will see in the evidence from this period, the basic features of the writing system and many of the themes associated with it can already be found. As we consider the culture of Chinese characters from the various perspectives represented in this symposium, I believe it's helpful to us to adopt a historical perspective to return to this early stage and to reflect on what we know and where the future will take us. So I will begin by considering the linguistic background of ancient China. What we know about the spoken languages of ancient China presents a diverse, complex, but at the same time a quite realistic picture. First, scholars in recent years are increasingly drawing on evidence from the Tibeto-Burman and Austronesian languages to reconstruct the earlier stages of Chinese. According to this view, such languages were descended from a common source, and evidence of this common heritage can still be seen in the first millennium BC, with which we concern in my presentation. Whatever the result of this effort, it's possible to suggest that then as now, there were many languages and dialects spoken in China, and speakers of these dialects and languages were not necessarily mutually comprehensible to each other. An example of a rather clear distinction is that on the basis of a reconstruction of the phonology of ancient China, with testimonies by several Han Dynasty scholars, Zhen Xuan, Gao You, Ru Chun, Liu Xi, we now know that in the region of the Shandong Peninsula, there was a sound change of the R coda to the J coda, and this is collaborated by evidence from the rhymes of the Shi Jing or the Book of Odes in the section called Chen Feng, with the state of Chen just being west of the Shandong Peninsula. And added to this, one should take into account traces of Austro-Asiatic and perhaps even Tocharian and Indo-European language in the Tarim Basin of the northwest. So all of this suggests a linguistic situation different from what we usually attribute to ancient China. So this is a map of the present-day People's Republic, and the red circles indicate roughly the areas that I just mentioned. So the circle on the left is the Tarim Basin with traces of the Indo-European language Tocharian, and the circle on the right is about modern-day Hubei province, where scholars argue that traces of Austro-Asiatic languages can be found. And then finally the circle around the Shandong Peninsula that's indicating the sound change that I just referred to. So in spite of all this, it is possible, it is likely that there was a common tongue, what is called koine in Latin and ya yan in the Chinese literary record, a common language that made communication possible among the speakers of the different languages inhibited in the area that we now call 
about China. And this is a topic that I will come back to by the end of my presentation. Turning to the writing representation of the spoken language, the beginning of the writing system is hard to pinpoint. Although there are evidence of what we can refer to as pre-writing or precursors of writing, the relation of these to actual writing is unclear. The fragmentary marks and symbols on pottery and other materials may or may not have been the steps that ultimately led to the invention of writing, if such steps can ever be traced. What we do know is that just as there were many different languages in China during this period, there was also more than one writing system. So, for instance, there is the case of what's usually called fashu writing or fashu symbols, a script found in the vicinity of Sichuan. It's unclear what's the relation between this and Chinese writing or even the Chinese language, because to this day the script, this fashu writing, remains undeciphered. And here are just a couple examples of what is clearly writing inscribed on a seal, but the meaning of which is unknown or unclear. And some further examples also on seals. For a writing system that's better preserved and better documented, we should turn to the evidence from the Shang, the inscriptions on bones and shells, and the Western Zhou, the inscriptions on bronze vessels. Okay. Inscription on a turtle plastron, and this is the Shi Tiang Pan, and you can see how the inscription is cast on the interior of the vessel. In both of these cases, the evidence points to a writing system in full operation, with the three basic types of characters already present, cementographs or biao yi characters, phonograms or xing shen, and finally longographs or jia jie. In general, scholars estimate that around 4,000 to 5,000 characters were in use during this time, and this is a figure consistent with modern usage. Now here, one might raise the question, just as there was a common tongue, the koine or ya yan that I mentioned earlier, how effective and widespread was the writing system? For the period of the Shang and Western Zhou, writing is closely associated with the royal activities of these two ruling powers, and by and large, they're confined to a single region, the Shang capital at Anyang in present-day Henan, and Zhou Yuan for the Western Zhou in present-day Shanxi province. Of course, the fact that the Shang and Western Zhou share the same writing system suggests that writing was somewhat a shared object, and this is especially true if one takes into account the overlap between the two dynasties. But it's really for the later part of this period that it's possible to ask this question, and this is a question that I will come back to by the end of the presentation. From the Shang and Western Zhou onwards, the writing system has remained in use and has remained consistent. This is especially true after the standardization of writing during the Qin and Han empires. From a historical perspective, the writing system has withstood the shift from manuscript to print and now to the Internet. 
It's also the case that for much of history, the study of writing system has never been interrupted. It began as early as uh, Xu Sheng, uh, writing around 100 AD. And of course, uh, Xu Sheng, in his work, notes how he's indebted to his predecessors. And this study of the Chinese writing system culminated in the 18th century, when the systematic study of the traditional data combined with a deep understanding of the nature of the writing system, particularly the relation between the writing system and the spoken language, led to a great number of innovative results. Now, since the beginning of the 20th century, the study of the writing system has, has moved in a different direction. And this is largely a result of the impact of archaeological discoveries. To be sure, paleographic resources had always been found throughout history, but it was with the introduction of archaeology and a series of systematic excavations that the pace of discovery really picked up. And to these, we owe the inscriptions on bones and shells and the inscriptions on bronze vessels that I mentioned earlier. Apart from these discoveries, there is now a greater body of evidence pertaining to the Eastern Zhou, particularly the Warring States period. What we find in this period is a greater variety of written sources in contrast to the uh, earlier part of the period. Many of these writings are of a local origin, so they include records of divination, legal and administrative documents, and inventory lists. Most remarkably, these sources reveal the writing practices of different regions, not only in terms of graphic form, but also the choice of character. Um, the choice of character for writing a particular work. The scholarship to identify the distinctions among the different regions began with the pioneering work of Wang Wowei, and it has been refined by Li Xueqin. So scholars now generally accept a division of Warring States writing into five regions, Qi, Yan, Jing, Chu, Qing. In recent years, with the works of Onishi Kazuya, Zhou Guo, uh, Chen Sipong, among others, this topic has emerged as one of the most important in the study of writing in ancient China. And here it's possible to go over some examples just to illustrate what I mean. Uh, the, the character Men uh, is a uh, cementograph. Uh, that depicts a gate, but among the different regions, it can be written a number of ways, as, as you can see on the, uh, on the screen. Uh, and another example is the character, it's the word uh, trust, xin. Okay, it's written in the character that we're all familiar with in all five regions of the Warring States. But in Jing, particularly, uh, it has a different form. And finally, uh, uh, another example is uh, Bi, okay, must. And uh, there is a contrast between Qin, Chu on the one hand, and Qi on the other. Uh, and finally, uh, the example is Yuan, uh, to resent. Uh, and once again, there is a contrast between Qing, Qi, and Jing on the one hand, and then Chu on the other hand. In uh, the scholar Onishi Kazuya's work, uh, he notes the distribution of the final particle, uh, Yue and Yi, uh, and also the distribution of the co coordinative conjunction, Qi and Yu, uh, and also the distribution of the temp temporal adverbial jiang and qie.
a further development in the last 40 years is the discovery of a large number of literary texts from the warring states Qing and Han. Many of these have parallels with the received literature. So there are manuscripts related to the Laozi, Confucius Analects, the Art of War, Sun Zi Bing Fa, and even the canonical texts of the Oaths, the Documents, and E.G. the Book of Changes. And then there are also texts that up to this point have been unknown. So all of these have added significantly to our understanding of the ancient world, and they can be approached from the perspectives of language, intellectual thought, social, political reality, and other aspects of ancient history. And this is an example of the text Zi, also a chapter from the canonical Li Ji, the Book of Rites. And it's a text that's now been found twice in manuscript form written on bamboo slips. For the purpose of my discussion today, I will focus on only one aspect of these literary texts, and that's the fact that they're sometimes available in multiple versions. These different versions, produced at different moments in time and space and by different hands, exhibit a mixture of the kind of writing practices that I just mentioned. And in this, they provide a contrast to the local writings of records of divination, legal and administrative documents, and inventory lists that I mentioned before. And some examples of this can be found in the Zi, the black robe from the Li Ji that I also mentioned before. So, for example, here's one chapter or one section of the Zi with the English translation at the bottom. If there's a cart, you will see its canopy. If there's an outer garment, you will see the pad. If a man has words, you will hear their sounds. If he has action, you will see their effects. And this is, so the bottom is from the second copy of this text. And as you can see, they are largely the same. But with some important exceptions. In the first version, there is the character B. And in the second version, the same word, must, is written in a different form. Another example, again, also from the Zi, the Lord Ya says, as for the sultry rain of summer, it's that the petty people daily resent it. And as for the brisk cold of the extreme of winter, it's also that the petty people daily resent it. When we look at the second version of the same text, again, they're by and large the same. But in their writing of the word to resent, Yuan, they employ different characters. And finally, a third example. If the ruler does not join with the petty people to plot great affairs, then the great ministers will not be resentful. The difference, once again, is in the writing of the word Yuan, using different characters in the two versions. So what does this mean? On the one hand, it's clear that there were broad and noticeable differences among the regions in their choice of character. 
And that's just the most noticeable of the differences. At the same time, it was possible for a single text, such as the Zi Yi, to move back and forth between such differences. Somehow, a text like the Zi Yi was able to transcend regional boundaries through a process of writing and rewriting. Now, keep in mind that in terms of quantity, the local writings, uh, the administrative records and so forth, they far outnumber the literary texts, and they're really the majority of uh, uh, writing in output. Nevertheless, uh, the fact that the literary texts exist, and the fact that they're not confined to any particular region, uh, suggests that there was in fact a common culture shared by the different uh, warring states regions. Such a culture of writing anticipated the unification of writing under the Qing. Uh, now, of course, what happened during the Qing uh, took place on a very large scale across the entire empire. But even then, uh, those efforts to reform writing did not take place overnight, and, and the process really continued into the, the Han period. So, uh, in short, uh, it, it would appear just as there were dialects and language differences, there were regional characteristics to the writing system. The spoken and the written language would have worked hand in hand and contributed to a more pronounced regional culture, especially for the period of political disunity uh, during the warring states. But against this background, there was also convergence. Uh, and, and several explanations are possible for this, but the most obvious one is that communication and cooperation were necessary, whether by a common speech or by a consistent writing system. Too much variation would have made communication cooperation um, difficult. And, and, and what's important to note is that uh, uh, this largely took place independent of political forces. And uh, in some ways, uh, we, we can say that uh, this an even anticipated uh, the political unification of China and the subsequent reforms of writing put forward by the uh, Qing dynasty. So uh, part, part of the reason that I have uh, focused on this topic is that the materials I have considered are very close to my own research, which is on um, how uh, the new discoveries are helping us to rethink the intellectual thoughts of the ancient world. Another reason is that I think it allows for an opportunity to reflect on the relation between writing and culture, particularly how a unified writing system has, uni has reinforced a unified... Let me, let me try again. Uh, this is an opportunity to reflect on the relation between writing and culture, particularly how a unified writing system has reinforced a unified culture and how this in turn has had an effect on the writing system itself. As we discuss the culture of Chinese characters in East Asia and consider the future of this culture, I believe there's much we can learn from reflecting on the earliest stage of this culture, drawing on sources and discoveries that have only become available uh, in recent times. So I'll stop here. Thank you.